Okay, gentlemen, so we're going to do Regents Review today. I'll try to get through some of the questions that are on a real Regents exam um, by way of reviewing material you should be going over uh, on your own, starting now. First, let's pray. Teach me, good Lord, to be generous, to serve you as you deserve, to give and not to count the cost, to fight and not to heed the wounds, to toil and not to seek for rest, to labor and ask for no reward, save that of knowing that I do your will. Okay, let's get right to it, gentlemen. Uh, this is going to be the exam um, from June of 2015. So similar to the exam that you're going to be taking, the questions, of course, are going to be different. Um, the Regents exam changes every year, as you know, but the same material is going to be covered, and the questions will be asked in a similar way. So you want to pay attention to that. All of you should be taking notes, careful notes as we go. Anything you are not absolutely sure of, any fact I talk about, which is news to you or which you've forgotten, you had better take a note on because I guarantee I am not going to do anything today that is not necessary for that exam. Okay, so let's take a look at the uh, first question here. The Regents exam often starts, first question, um, something visual, they give you a map, they give you a chart, which may or may not have anything to do with early American history. Uh, not all of the questions are exactly in chronological order. They like to use political cartoons a lot, like this one. Okay, which statement most accurately expresses the main idea of this cartoon? Take a minute and look at it. Okay, and the correct answer is, of course, going to be what? Conflict is growing, number four, over the distribution of scarce water resources. The other choices don't make any sense. You don't have to know any history to do that. You've got agriculture, farmer, and you've got um, the cities here. And obviously, these two guys fighting over uh, war, uh, for fighting over water. Nothing here about water pollution. Uh, farmers fail to understand the water needs of cities. Well, this this is, doesn't really seem to be taking the side of the farmer or of the city guy particularly. Urban development has used all the water needed for farming. Again, this doesn't really taking sides. So the only choice that makes sense there is number four. Easy. Okay, then let's scroll down and look at the next one. Okay, question two. Two things to notice about this question. It is a question they love to ask, and it is a question that is asked in a style they love to use. This business of uh, here's an outline, pick the best heading, this is very big with the Regents exam, and all three of these items show up. Okay, so which completes, uh, title best completes the partial outline below. So what have you got? The Virginia House of Burgesses. Okay, what do we remember about the Virginia House of Burgesses? If you don't remember anything, you should be taking notes. Virginia House of Burgesses, as the name implies, was in the colony of Virginia. It was an elected legislature, elected by the landowners and plantation owners of Virginia, and uh, basically governed the colony. The Mayflower Compact, on the other hand, was a document. Compact is an agreement, as we remember. Mayflower was, of course, the ship that brought the um, pilgrims and the other settlers over to the Massachusetts Bay Colony. The point of the Massachusetts of the Mayflower Compact was that the colonists on board the ship, before they even landed, made this agreement with each other, written contract, in which they all agreed to um, make the rules as a community, and they all agreed to be bound by those rules once they were made. So they all kind of put in and said, you know. We'll, we'll form a little community, we'll rule ourselves by majority vote, and we all agree to be bound by the rules we make as a community. 
Well, it's very nice and it's very practical, but the big thing was that they chose not to wait for directions from back home in London. They said, once we get to America, we're going to have to govern ourselves. Okay. Third item there, C, New England town meetings. We remember that in New England, uh, you had these small um, uh, towns uh, surrounded by small farms, as opposed to Virginia. Virginia, we recall, was all about big plantations, and so you had towns, uh, you didn't really have towns the way you had in New England. New England was all about small farms clustered around a village. At least once a year, the um, adult male landowners of the town would get together for a town meeting, and they would make the laws for the coming year, they would decide what they were going to spend the town money on, if they were going to build a school, what have you. Okay. Well, you look at those three things together. Um, the elected legislature of Virginia, colony of Virginia, the agreement that the Massachusetts Bay settlers made to form um, their own lawmaking community, and the New England town meetings where everybody in town, or at least everybody who counted, that would have been an adult male landowner, uh, got a say in how the town was governed. Which best completes this, therefore? Okay, hopefully you got this one correct, too. It would be the developments in colonial self-government. That's the only one that makes sense. Colonial efforts to abandon British rule. These are all very early. This is all happening in the 1600s, these things. Yeah? America is not interested in, in leaving the British Empire at that point, so that makes no sense. Attempts by colonial leaders to form a national government. Well, it's the Virginia House of Burgesses, it's New England town meetings, and the Mayflower Compact applied really only, not even to the whole colony of Massachusetts, but only to one part of it. So there's no national government going on there. Colonial organizations established by the British Parliament. In fact, none of that was the case. The Mayflower Compact was put together by the people on the ship as their own idea. Same thing with New England town meetings. They just kind of happened. The British didn't authorize them. Uh, and certainly the Virginia House of Burgesses was not something that the Parliament um, authorized. So each of these things, the only thing that makes sense is colonial self-government. Important to notice that. Why? Because that self-government theme goes all the way through uh, the founding of America. From the 1600s on, Americans are used to governing themselves. So by the time we get to the 1770s, we're all set to say, why are we taking any orders from um, England? Why are we listening to Parliament at all? Without all of this, you wouldn't have the setup for the American Revolution. Why do I take a moment to talk about that? Because it could uh, be a, an essay. On your version of the Regents' exam, they might well say, you know, here's your essay, outline the steps of colonial self-government that led to the American Revolution. Okay, let's look at number three. One way that the British government carried out the policy of um, mercantilism or mercantilism uh, was by what? All right, so let's remember what mercantilism or mercantilism is. Merchant, yeah. This was the idea that these empires in the uh, 16 and 1700s had colonies. The purpose of the colonies was to supply the mother country with cheap natural resources. The mother country would manufacture it into manufactured goods and sell it back to the colony. So in America, they might grow uh, cotton or um, uh, indigo. We remember indigo was a, a key uh, export from the early colonies. It was that purple dye, blue dye that they made. Colonies are providing the raw material, selling it back to mother country England at a cheap price. Why cheap? They had no place else to sell it. They weren't allowed to sell it to any other country except the mother country. England takes that, 
turns it into cloth, sells the cloth back to the colonies at an inflated price. Why? Because the colonies weren't allowed to buy anything from any other country. Okay. So, one way that the British government carried out the policy of uh, mercantilism is by, well, promoting free trade between its colonies and Europe doesn't make sense. They didn't want free trade between the colonies and Europe. They wanted free trade between the colonies and England only. Prohibiting transatlantic trade in the enslaved Africans. Prohibiting it? No, England England didn't stop the trade, the, the slave trade, until the 1800s. They needed slaves, as you remember, because they ran out of indentured servants in Virginia and started importing um, African slaves to work in the sugarcane fields and then the tobacco fields. Encouraging the development of colonial manufacturing and trade. That's the opposite of mercantilism. You don't want the colonies manufacturing stuff. If an American can, say, grow cotton in America, turn it into cloth in America, and sell the cloth to other Americans, the mother country doesn't make any money on this. You want them to grow the cotton here, ship it back to England, and then ship the cloth from England back to the colony. So that makes no sense. Requiring that most colonial trade occur within the British Empire. That's the only one that makes sense. Why? Because as long as the colonies were trading with England and England with the colonies, England was making money on it. That's what it was about. Okay. Let's move on, shall we? All right. Question four. Once again, guys, your exam will have different questions, but I guarantee each of these items we talked about will show up in some way. They love to ask about colonial self-government. They love to ask about mercantilism, mercantilism, and they love to ask about Thomas Jefferson, Declaration of Independence, and John Locke. It's going to show up somehow. All right, so Thomas Jefferson incorporated John Locke's idea of the social contract theory in the Declaration of Independence. Hang on a second, and let's just get to this. So Thomas Jefferson, of course, writes the Declaration of Independence and presents it to Congress. He almost plagiarizes John Locke. I mean, almost word for word. He takes the philosopher John Locke's ideas, puts them into the, into the Declaration of Independence. John Locke's big idea is the social contract. Social contract is... Each of us is endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights. That is, each human being has directly from God, not from any government, the right to life, liberty, and John Locke would say, property. We say, Thomas Jefferson said, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You have that right. You give up a little bit of your rights to create a government. The purpose of government is to protect all of our other rights. It gets its power from the consent of the governed. So the contract is, each of us will give a little bit of our rights into the general pool, and from that the government makes a, a commitment to protect our basic rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's the social contract. Okay, so Jefferson incorporated this idea in the Declaration because, why? Did it call for a gradual change of government? No, and Jefferson wasn't calling for a gradual change of government. It supported the divine right of kings, just the opposite. Locke said, kings don't get their power because God gives it to them. Kings get their power because we give it to them. Because it considered economic rights more important than inalienable rights. That doesn't even make sense. An inalienable right is a right that you can't give away. To alienate something means to get rid of it, to give it away. Economic rights, 
an inalienable right. There, you, you could theoretically have an economic right that's inalienable. This doesn't make any sense. What are you left with? It justified the overthrow of government that denied individual liberties. Remember that phrase from the Declaration of Independence. What's the phrase? We hold these truths there we go, to be self-evident. What? That all men are created equal. That they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable oh that's good that among these whoops my typing is good are life liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Now here it comes, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That when a government becomes destructive of these ends, oops, bang, bang, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it. So, we're endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that governments are instituted among us to secure those rights, to protect them, and that governments derive their just powers from the consent of the governed, and that when a government becomes destructive of this, when it's not doing its job, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it. So, Jefferson incorporated John Locke's idea of the social contract theory because this idea justified the overthrow of a government that denied individual liberties, which is what the colonists were complaining about. Okay, question five. Based Base your answer to question five on the passage below in your knowledge of social studies. Remember, guys, use everything they give you. Thomas Paine, common sense. Remember Thomas Paine? He was that great writer during the American Revolution. Um, he writes this pamphlet, really, booklet called Common Sense, early in 1776. The importance of common sense is that... Um, before he writes it, the Americans have already started fighting, but they're fighting, many of them, for their rights as Englishmen. Thomas Paine's common sense says, we are something new. We shouldn't be fighting for our rights as Englishmen. We should be fighting for our own country to govern ourselves the way we see fit. That's the importance of common sense, and it really transformed the revolution, as we talked about. So let's look at the quote. As to government matters, it is not in the power of Britain to do this continent justice. So Britain can't do the right thing by us. The business of it will soon be too weighty and intricate to be managed with any tolerable degree of convenience by a power so distant from us and so very ignorant of us. So what's he saying here? Whoops. He's saying um, England can't really do a decent job of governing us. Why? 
They're way too far away. They really don't understand us Americans. Um, it's not practical. For if they cannot govern, uh, conquer us, they cannot govern us. To be always running three or four thousand miles with a tail or a petition, waiting four or five months for an answer, which, when obtained, requires five or six more to explain it in, will in a few years be looked upon as folly and childishness. So remember, to cross the ocean at this time took um, a couple months. And so every time the Americans, he's complaining, you know, if the British had their way, every time we did anything, we'd ask their permission. We'd have to send a guy on a ship a few months over there, talk to government officials, get an answer, take a few months to come back, and then take another few months to explain what the hell happened. This doesn't make any sense. There was a time when it was proper, and there is a proper time for it to cease. So maybe it was okay when we started off as colonies, but not anymore. Okay, so question. What is the main argument Thomas Paine makes concerning the relationship between Great Britain and its American colonies? Question one, uh, answer one. Britain wants to make America part of the European continental system. Does that make any sense? I don't think so. That has nothing to do with this. America is too distant for Britain to govern effectively. That's exactly what he's saying. America lacks representation in Parliament. Be careful. It was true America lacked representation in Parliament. It was even true Thomas Paine complained about that in other places. But he doesn't say it here, and that's what you have to pay attention to. And your fourth choice, American colonial leaders believe British officials want to use them to fight European wars. That's the completely irrelevant, cockamamie answer. Okay, let's look at number six. Ah, uh, once again, this is a question they love to ask about this issue. The Constitutional Convention of 1787, the great compromise between the large states and the small states, resulted in what? Okay, so let's talk about this one. This is a really important one to review because they will always find a way to ask a question on this subject, although they ask it 20 different ways. So here's the thing to remember. Constitutional Convention. 1787. The American Revolution is over, we remember. Um, the Articles of Confederation, which was our very, very, very first government, fails. The government isn't strong enough to do anything. So they get together uh, in Philadelphia for the Constitutional Convention to write a new document to govern America. That's the U.S. Constitution. They have a problem. The problem is the verb to be. Is the United States an is or is it an are? Huh? That is to say, are we one country made up of states, or are we many states that make up a country? Now, what's the point there? If we're one country, then our representation should be by our people, which is to say, one person, one vote. Or at least one person has a piece of a vote. Therefore, we'd have a legislature, the lawmaking part of the government, that is population based. 
So you'd have one representative for every 670,000 people. Or one state, one vote. Legislature would have equal representation for each state. If you think about the United Nations, the United States gets one vote in the United Nations. So does England. So does France. So does China. So does this, uh, Russia. So does um, Mexico. So does El Salvador. All of them have very different populations. But because the UN is a gathering of each of these individual units we call countries, everybody gets one vote. So the question is, what were we? With the Constitutional Convention, are we one nation and so we should divide up the legislature by population? Or are we 13 states at the time and so each state should get an equal say? Well, that may seem very philosophical and theoretical, but there's a deeper issue, or a more practical issue, I guess I should say, at hand. The big states, like Virginia, wanted population-based Congress. Why? Virginia, at the time, was the most populous state in the new United States. may seem odd to us now, but that's where the bulk of the population was. New York was nowhere near that yet. Under the Virginia plan, we would have a Congress where we divide the country, we divide the, the representation up by state, by population. That would mean Virginia would get the most votes. New Jersey was not so happy about that. New Jersey was a small state, much less population. They were concerned about protecting themselves from the power of the big states. So the New Jersey plan was each state gets the same representation in Congress. That way, the little guys could get together and outvote the big guys so they wouldn't be bullied. Virginia's point was, if we have more people, shouldn't we have more say? New Jersey's plan was, but we're a federation of 13 states, shouldn't each state be treated equally? The answer to this was what was called the Connecticut plan. Connect a cut. Um, so named because uh, Roger Sherman, who was the uh, delegate to the Constitutional Convention of Connecticut, came up from it. But it's better known as the Great Compromise. From it, we would get a Congress with two houses, therefore called bicameral. A camera means chamber in Latin. So, bicameral, two chambers, two houses of Congress. The House of Representatives would be based on population. So, each state would get a number of representatives based on its population. Virginia, at the time, getting the most. New Jersey getting less. Rhode Island getting the least. And a Senate. Each state gets two senators, How, no matter how big they are or small they are. To pass law, both houses must agree on the new law proposed. So if you've got an idea for a law, it has to get a majority vote in both the Senate and the House. Therefore, in theory, at least, you have to have a majority of the people of the United States behind it and a majority of the number of states. 
Great Compromise, Connecticut Plan, Bicameral Legislature, Virginia Plan, New Jersey Plan, know them all because the regents will ask every year a question on all of this in some form. Okay, uh, so here we have the question. The Constitutional Convention of 1787, Great Compromise between large states and small states resulted in the creation of a bicameral legislature. Notice the other choices there. A provision for equal protection of the laws. That's the 14th Amendment, gentlemen. That comes after the Civil War. A permanent solution to the slavery issue. That is the result of the Civil War. That doesn't come till the 13th Amendment. The guarantee of voting rights for all male property owners. In fact, that doesn't appear in the Constitution. There's nothing in there about who votes. All it says is that when you have voting for Congress, the state will make the rules, but the state has to use the rules it uses for its own legislature. Some states had property requirements. You had to own so much land or you had to have so much money. Other states didn't. And over time, as you know, we know in the early 1800s, they all did away with them piece by piece. So that by the time of the Civil War, all adult white males could vote. After the Civil War, all adult males, black and white, theoretically could vote, although we remember the Jim Crow laws that prevented blacks from really doing that. And then it wasn't until um, 1920 that women got the right to vote with the um, 19th Amendment. Okay, now... I want to just mention one other thing. It doesn't happen to be in this exam, but they usually ask it. Um, it is, it, it's, as I said, the exam we're looking at at the moment doesn't have it in it, but nine times out of ten, they find a way to ask about the three-fifths. That should be three-fifths. Compromise. Make sure we remember this one because chances are they will ask about it. The problem was this. There are no slaves in Massachusetts. Half the population of Virginia is slaves. And that's correct because half, and it shows should be singular, even doesn't, though it doesn't sound right. So half the population of Virginia is slaves. How do we count them? How do we count them? Well, one at a time. No. How do we count them for representation in Congress. At the Constitutional Convention, in 1787, this was a real issue. Massachusetts said, look, if you count the slaves in Virginia when you're trying to figure out how many representatives Virginia gets, they're going to get twice as many as they should have. Slaves aren't allowed to vote. Slaves don't pay taxes. Slaves aren't citizens. So why should they count toward um, the number of representatives Virginia gets? If you give it to them, Virginia will just get to outvote everybody all the time. And we here in Massachusetts, we've done away with slavery already. Remember, Massachusetts did away with slavery during the American Revolution. Uh, one of the first, the, uh, Pennsylvania did away with it first, and, and Massachusetts was really kind of second. So Massachusetts didn't want slaves to count at all because it put them at a disadvantage. The South, on the other hand, was afraid that if you didn't count slaves, the northern states, which were in the process of abolishing slavery already even back in 1787, they would use their power to make slavery illegal in the South. So what to do? The answer is the three-fifths compromise. 
you count up the number of slaves, multiply that number by three fifths, which is to say 60%, and you add that into your census figures. So when you're counting the population of Virginia for purposes of congressional representation, you count, of course, the whites, you count the number of slaves, and they count as 60% of their total number. What does that do? Well, it does give Virginia extra representation, which way they were desperate to get so that they would have enough votes in the South to keep the federal government from one day abolishing slavery. However, it didn't give them such an overwhelming number that the northern states felt completely threatened by it. Three-fifths compromise, again, know what it is. It is almost certainly going to show up on your regions. Okay, let's look at number seven. The framework of government described in the Constitution most clearly shows the dissatisfaction of the founders with what? Here are your choices. The Albany Plan of Union. Remember the Albany Plan of Union? That was that proposal in the midst of the French and Indian War, made by Benjamin Franklin, saying, boy, you know, we really should cooperate more and maybe have some kind of a national government here in the Americas. But the Albany Plan of Union never went anyplace, didn't do anything, and everybody forgot about it. So that doesn't fit in with this. That didn't influence the Constitution, really. The Northwest Ordinance. The Northwest Ordinance had nothing to do with this. The Northwest Ordinance, if we remember, was that law passed by the Articles of Confederation Congress that let the Congress sell off the land in what was then the Northwest. That meant Ohio and Indiana and Illinois, what we would call the Midwest today. That's the 1780s. We had just gotten our hands on it after 1783. It wasn't a state yet, wasn't settled yet, so Congress sold the land to farmers. The government made a lot of money that way to get it started. Some of the money had to be set aside, if you remember, for schools in the Northwest Territory. But it actually worked very well. Nobody was dissatisfied with it. The Treaty of Paris. The Treaty of Paris is what ended the American Revolution, where the British walked away and said, okay, we give up. So Americans weren't dissatisfied with that. Ah, the Articles of Confederation. Remember the Articles of Confederation? That's the thing that says um, uh, that was the, the form of government that didn't work. There was no president in the Articles of Confederation. There was no court system. There was just a Congress. And basically, the Congress had to be unanimous about everything to get anything done. It didn't work. It was a, it was a, a disaster. That was what they were dissatisfied with and why they wrote the Constitution. Okay. Let's talk about, now, federalism. And if it seems like we're doing a lot on government, we are. Remember, it's the U.S. history and government regions, guys. Federalism, we've talked about. Federalism means that we are a federation, a collection of states. So in many ways, we're one country, but in other ways, we are a collection of states. And each state keeps its ability to govern itself. All right. Therefore, the division of power between the states and the national government is the correct answer here. The point of federalism is that the federal government does some things, but the states keep their power to do other things. Know the definition. Finally, uh, I'll do the checks and balances. The point of checks and balances, remember, we have three branches of government. The three branches of government are the legislative, which makes the law, the executive, which carries out the law, the 
president and the people who work for him, and the judicial branch, whoops, judicial, that interpret what, what the law means. So the legislative branch is the Congress. They pass laws. The executive branch is the president. He's got to run the country day to day. And the judiciary, the judicial branch, or the courts that determine how the law applies and what it means in a particular case. One of the things built into the Constitution are checks and balances. To make sure no one part of the government becomes more powerful than the other two parts. Do not move if the bell rings. Let me finish. Um, the, these three branches are constantly pushing against each other. So Congress makes the law, but the president has to sign it. He can veto a law by Congress. Congress can still pass it over his veto, but they need a 66%. They need a two-thirds majority to do it. The president has the right to run the, the government day to day, but he can only do those things that Congress gives him the authority to do and the money to do. The courts have the ultimate right of, watch it, judicial review. Need to know it. The case of Marbury v. Madison. It shows up every year on the regent's exam in some way. Marbury v. Madison was a Supreme Court case where the Supreme Court said the court has the ultimate right to determine whether an action by the president or Congress is constitutional. The judicial branch gets to review their actions. And if they say the court says it's unconstitutional, then it's unconstitutional. These three branches pushing against each other, blocking each other from getting too powerful, means that government only works when it cooperates and when no one branch is trying to take over. That's built into the Constitution. Okay, I'm going to leave it there, guys. I hope you found this useful. Um, we will do more of this. Again, I will be available all next week after school and during third period, um, third, uh, fourth and sixth periods uh, to um, do a review with you if you want during your lunch periods. Do not forget to do the homework that you've been assigned for the weekend, and I'll see you next week.